Not much luck today. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Here we are. We are there. We are live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Best New True Crime Story Serial Killers Facebook Live event number four. And we are here to discuss the Best New True Crime Story Serial Killers. And I am joined by my contributor, Joe Turner, who's coming to us live from the United Kingdom. Hi, Joe. Hello. How are you doing? Fine. How are you doing in our time of quarantine? It's fine. It's the same for me. Nothing's really changed. I've been working from home for years anyway. It's just kind of like I go out more now than I did before. Does that mean I go for a walk every day with my son? And that's more than I ever used to do. So, yeah, it's uh, nothing. I'm so jealous for people who have got nothing to do. It was, oh, I'm sitting around, I'm sitting here watching TV. Like, no, I'm working like a dog. So, yeah, it's not very nice. How are you? I, How is it over in America? I, I, it's, it, I understand exactly what you're saying. I don't feel like it's any big change for me other than the fact that I need a hazmat suit to go out to buy groceries or, you know. <laughs> I've seen you, I've seen your, your posts, you know. Uh, I'm taking groceries there. <laughs> yeah, all this stuff in my deliveries and the FedEx boxes piling up and the loo roll well, finally so arrived. <laughs> we yeah, opened up the good. champagne, the loo roll is here. <laughs> oh, finally, yeah, I finally got loo roll here. So I know. I know. I think for people like us, we don't really notice a huge difference in our lifestyles. And actually, mm -hmm. I I quite like it. I'm not very social, but, you know, once in a blue moon. Yeah, it's but... yeah. <laughs> so seems like exactly the same for me, yeah. <laughs> well. I know. So um, we're here to chat about the story that you've written for the book, uh, which is called mm -hmm. The Rat Man, um, which uh, is about a Japanese serial killer. Uh, so tell me, what made, what's, what sparked your interest in Japan and in Japanese serial killers? Oh, that's a tough one. Well, like the, the whole concept of serial killers is kind of, it's completely different than what it is in the Western world. Like most people think that the Western world is kind of unique in the way that it approaches serial killers because they're they're massively different. Like if you compare the number of, or, or the crime statistics anyway, from Japan to uh, the UK, um, they're massively different. Even though Japan is twice the size of the UK, their murder rate is something like sort of seven hundred a year, whereas the UK is closer to sort of sixteen hundred a year. So it's kind of it's quite um, it's quite incredible, and the culture, sort of Asian culture in general, it kind of it sort of creates serial killers in a different way than what the Western world does. So we'll get into that later, but that's kind of the spark that sort of got me going on that kind of route, yeah. Okay, um, well, you've actually, um, you kind of answered my question a bit about this type of crime being as common uh, in the UK, obviously not, and obviously not as common as in the USA. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you do discuss a bit about uh, some of the cultural mindsets regarding that. I mean, um, there are strange crimes in Japan. I, I spent oh, a month in Japan. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not crime free at all. It's just no. Crime free in there. There's lots of arson attacks and mass shootings and stuff like that. Um, it's just on a, a much smaller scale compared to pretty much every other country in the world. Yeah, the the famous Yakuza. <laughs> yeah, the, oh yeah, the Yakuza are quite responsible for uh, quite a few of those. And the same with the sort of Tokyo subway attacks. There's a lot more sort of massacres in Japan than small scale crimes in other countries, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So it still gets its burglaries and robberies and knife crimes and stuff like that. So it's not completely sort of, it's not some paradise of crime free. Yeah, yeah. So, so the reputation of it being so safe is perhaps mm, mm. take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, and, and that's um, that's kind of it, it is. Um, it makes it sort of open to exploitation from Westerners who know that Japan is kind of the crime is very lax over there. So a lot of people will be tempted to travel over there in order to commit crimes. The past couple of years, there's been a um, an increase in pickpockets going around sort of Tokyo. Because they know people are more, they they're happy to leave sort of wallets and purses on the side, stuff like that. So it's become kind of a an attraction to Western thieves because it's easy, <laughs> easy stealing, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, people thieves can be quite ambitious. Yeah, let's move to the other side of the world no, to do we'll more thieving. Wallets, yeah, <laughs> 
Um, so tell us a bit about um, your subject, uh, the the uh, serial <laughs> killer himself. <laughs> you can't pronounce it, can you? <laughs> well, I, I'm leaving that to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's Satomu, the silent T, Satomu Miyazaki. Okay, um, so Tomo Miyazaki was uh, born in Saitama, Japan, to Tokyo in uh, the 60s. Um, he, when he was born, he was um, a little bit deformed. He was, he was very small, even by sort of Japanese standards. Um, he had uh, strange hands. His hands were kind of formed, so he looked a bit like Nosferatu. Um, and because of this, he got bullied quite a lot in his, um, in his younger years. He was never able to make friends. Um, and from then on, his life just kind of went into a... A sort of spiral of sort of madness. He went from a, a sort of socially excluded child to a frustrated teenager to a disturbed adult to a serial killer. And kind of one of the things that fascinated me about him was that you could see the progression of his kind of his psychopathology went from you could you could see the sort of trigger moments in his life that made him devolve even further until he eventually reached um, the point where he had to go out and kill children mm. yeah well you you follow that quite it's it's quite fascinating in your story of how you actually do paint the picture of how this seemingly like a, you know any, any like, well i can't quite say normal kid because it sounds like he had a strike against him already with the deformity and and mm. you know as you know children could be quite evil <laughs> the innocence oh, yeah. of children Someone i think that's a myth yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but i mean the, the progression of how this this whole thing just affected him and in, in his development and and how he mm. goes from childhood through his teens to adulthood i mean it it yeah. it, it sheds some light a bit of understanding on maybe what twisted his mind to this level because i mean his crimes mm. in this story are extremely heinous <laughs> which you know we'll we'll chat about that a bit but i mean it's it's pretty heinous subject matter i mean serial killers are pretty nasty characters anyways it's one but of the worst I've ever read. Yeah, absolutely. yeah this is bad yeah this is bad um mm -hmm. so what so just to give us an idea a rundown what was his what were his crimes what was his mo what who were his victims um when he was about sort of 20, I think he was 25 or 26, he started um, prowling the streets. Simple kind of disorganized killer, if you will. He didn't have the intention of kind of abducting anyone. He just did it when the opportunity, opportunity arose. He was an opportunistic killer. So he was. Um, he would drive around uh, Saitama, Tokyo, where he lived, um, and he would focus on young girls. Again, this is where sort of Tokyo, uh, Japan's lax crime rate kind of worked in his advantage because there were so many little girls or little children walking around without the aid of, of the supervision of parents because they weren't used to, you know, criminals just rolling by and abducting children. So that sort of, that was one of the factors which went into why he was such a, why he was able to do what he did. And um, so he would drive around, he would see a young girl, young girls of his kind of preference. Um, he would lure them into his car just by promises of anything that he could think of. The first victim, um, Marie Connor, he told her that he would, it was a hot day and he said, would you like to go somewhere where it's a bit cooler out of the sun? And she said, yes. Got her into the car. Um, as soon as the opportunity arose, he would strangle her, took her into the woods and disposed of her body. And every time that was kind of his exact MO, he never really deviated from the MO until he, he got caught when he got a bit too confident. But yeah, he, that MO worked for him and he, he stuck with it for um, for four victims, tried to be a fifth, but that was that was the end of the story. I shouldn't really give the end away there, should I? <laughs> yeah. and, and, but these crimes were, were sexually motivated crimes. They, they weren't just abducting and murder. There's quite a yeah. bit of... There was a lot of um, every, everything else, pretty much. I mean, it's strange because he would... Um, well, he was sort of a, a known kind of sexual deviant from when he was a teenager because he used to um, spy on women at school with a camera. He used to go into the tennis courts at school and try and take, you know, upskirt shots. I don't know if he did that without noticing, but that's... That's, that's pretty thing. common in Japan. <laughs> yeah, well, so they probably did mine, so yeah, carry on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he would do that. Um, yeah, he was very, um, he was very, he was a sexually frustrated all through his life. I mean, he probably never had sort of a girlfriend or anything like that, and he completely avoided women of, of any kind he never really talked to them other than sort of spying on them with his cameras so that kind of, kind of lent itself to his psychopathology of why he was such a, a sexual deviant 
Um, and yet after, with his first victim, he didn't really do anything because he was, you know, the first victim is always kind of an experiment. He wasn't really sure what he wanted to do. Um, but with his um, subsequent victims, he kind of, he sexually assaulted them. He dismembered them. He even ate some of their body parts. He drank their blood. Yeah, he was, uh, he was an all around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not 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 someone you want to bring home to meet mummy mummy right no, absolutely not, yeah. Stay away, <laughs> oh my yeah. god but yeah that that's pretty that's pretty harsh i mean so so his his victims were we're talking about children like what five five years old around uh, that four age? five and seven please but these four victims yeah oh Two, man four, five and seven right? And and they just were like innocently minding their own business walking home from school or whatever yeah. and not even thinking no and and then, that would be completely alien to them. They would never know that someone would um, be able to do that. It's just um, it's an alien concept to the parents. Think, oh no, there's no chance a serial killer is going to come by and abduct my child. It just doesn't happen in this country. And so that that, um, that was his advantage. Yeah. And and when were when did these crimes take place? Uh, 1989, I believe. 1988, 89. Yeah. Okay, so not that long ago, really. No, over the span of uh, 11 months, it took. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so do, do you think it's, has, has this actually perhaps um, shined, shown, shine, shown a light on, on this that perhaps uh, parents might be a bit more vigilant or, or is it pretty much forgotten already? No, this was, um, this was kind of a very important sort of milestone in Japan's sort of emphasis on how to handle crime because um, it's strange. Someone told me once, Japan has got too many police officers and not enough criminals. <laughs> so it's, kind of, yeah, it's kind of like... Send them uh, over here. Send the coppers yes, here, right? Yeah. Everyone else could use them, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's strange because um, that kind of sounds like a good thing on paper, doesn't it? Oh, it's no crime. We're all just sitting around. So, but then when something like a serial murder or an arson attack or a mass shooting or something like that happens, the police are kind of not equipped to deal with you because they don't know what to do. They've spent the past their careers just kind of coasting around dealing with petty crimes. Uh, it's, it's funny. I've got a friend who lives in Tokyo, and he said, um, in, in his apartment complex, he's got a little garden inside, him. and in his garden are these sort of small statues, just like like gnomes. And um, he once saw some youths steal one of these gnomes and then run off, and he quickly <laughs> thinking that like who's going to care it's just some statues he said within a minute there's like three cars three squad cars pulled up on his drive like, <laughs> to find the gnome no one's not missing <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna catch this thing it was like the most important thing of their day so that's kind of a, an example of what it was and i was over there once and i saw um there was a shopping bag Le like a bag of shoppings left on on this little post that started the people were walking past these i was still spoke about the shopping and there were these two police officers on the other side of the road, just kind of watching, just thinking, what, what's going on here? Something's a mess. Something's going on. They had nothing better to do than watch a sort of bag of shopping in the street. So that's the kind of thing that they're, uh, that they're dealing with. So when someone like Satomo Miyazaki comes along and starts murdering and abducting children, it's, uh, it's a bit of a shock. Um, and that was one of the reasons why, when the, the first two victims were went missing, they were very reluctant to call it a murder case because they, they didn't have murder cases. Um, and it was only when the third victim uh, went missing and they found the remains of the first one that they thought, oh, no, this is a serial murder case. Um, and since that case happened in the 80s, it's, it has kind of made them think this does happen over here. It's not um, a Western phenomenon. It's, uh, it happens everywhere. And since then, there's been more I say similar cases because he was kind of, I don't say the worst, but, you know, the, uh, the most prolific. Um, so yeah, it made them uh, it made them kind of book up their ideas a little bit. In, in a way, it was a loss of innocence too. I think for cultural loss of innocence that this uh, you know as, yeah. as opposed to the U.S. and the U.K. and there are you know we've had a lot of these type of cases. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're kind of used to it, but now it did have a sort of damning effect because um, at the time it was kind of known as the um, the otaku murderer. And otaku is Japanese the word for um, someone who gets. Some, obsessed with something kind of like it, it's mostly correlated to sort of manga and anime and cartoons and video games and like pop culture but it can be for anything sort of 
Uh, I would be a, a, a whiskey otaku because I've got a lot of whiskey, so I really like it. So that would be kind of an otaku for me. Um, and of course, Miyazaki had loads of um, videotapes, um, comic books, and stuff like that in his apartment. They kind of labelled him as that kind of as though that was the thing that made him do what he did. And that subculture, which is still huge in Japan and everywhere in the world, it's still kind of recovering from him. Like if you sort of search on internet now, Otaku culture, you'll come across Miyazaki's name. Mm, He's still mm. trying to undo what he did. Yeah, yeah you, you mentioned in your story about the fact that uh, he seemed to live in a fantasy world as, as the years went on and he became more and more isolated and more and more um, not engaging with others uh, and, and inward that uh, that perhaps in a way he, he almost didn't see his victims as actual flesh and blood human beings, but as like a comic, like a manga. Yeah. Fake characters, fictional characters that he could easily kill off and that no one would ever miss. But of course that was, that was far from the truth. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, obviously. Yeah. Um, now, why, why, tell us a bit about the title, The Rat Man. Why is he The Rat Man? The Rat Man was, um, see, when Miyazaki consumed all of the media that he could, all of the, um, the anime, all of the cartoons, all of the comic books, he decided to make his own. And the one character that he continuously drew was the, um, some weird thing called the rat man that he, that he drew himself and it was just this rat with uh, no eyes massive head this really creepy creature and then that kind of went away he never really um did anything with that for the remainder of his crimes until it was time um for his uh, trial his courtroom appearances when he blamed his actions on the rat man he said <laughs> this uh, this is kind of something that we saw in america with david burkowitz he blamed his actions on a the dog that lived next door that told him to murder. And Miyazaki tried to do this with um, his own creation. But unfortunately, because he wasn't labeled insane, it, they saw it as, a, as um, an attempt to, for the insanity defense, where it means he wouldn't get a death penalty, but it didn't work. They saw that he was just trying to blame his actions on something other than himself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you think that was premeditated or do you think he might honestly have blamed that there was a rat man he actually it's, saw you know no it's it's strange because he's um he's by definition a kind of disorganized serial killer he didn't really know what he was doing he would just drive around and pray that a victim fell into his lap but then his crimes themselves they kind of showed a, an ounce of sort of organization like he would dispose of the body parts he would cut them off he would burn them he would dismember them where no one could find them he would try and sort of um use forensic cancer measures so the police would know where he was so it's kind of a it's tough to say whether he was aware of his actions or not so but personally i do think he was just trying to get out of uh, the death penalty so yeah, yeah. I think he was just playing the uh, playing playing the court yeah, because he definitely sounds like he, he thought everything out quite carefully. Even though he was disorganized, he clearly knew what he was doing to... Uh... Yeah, was, there was too many variables for him to not be in control of his actions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, he's another one of these serial killers who, who got caught by by a sort of random stupid bit of bad luck, right? Mm -hmm. He was um, he's potentially his last victim, his fifth victim. Um, he took her into a car and he tried to videotape her while she was naked. Um, her sister, who she'd been playing with, told her father that their, her sister had been taken by a strange man. The father went around and um, viciously attacked Miyazaki in the back of a car. And then he ran off down the streets completely naked, which I can only imagine what that looked like. I imagine it's quite funny. But, <laughs> and then, but then when he came back to his car, the police were there and he just gave himself up. I think he kind of realized the severity of his actions and he thought, I'm not going to get away with this. I'm not sophisticated enough to get away with this. I'm just going to hand myself in. So he did. He, just, he literally walked into the arms of the police. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, yeah. It, it's, it's not sort of what you would expect. I mean, no, uh, no. It's, I yeah. would not expect that from him at all. Um, going by his sort of psychological profile, you'd think that he would just run hide away and try not to come out but so it's very bizarre that he did what he did that's another kind mm -hmm. of strange element to the case 
Wow. I mean, I, I wonder if perhaps he just did, had gone as far as he could go. I mean, each crime sort of was an acceleration, yeah, correct? That would be more and more, he, more extreme as he went mm. on. And maybe he reached the pinnacle and there was nothing to mm. top it. Mm, it could be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was kind of an introverted type anyway. So prison was probably absolutely fine for him because he was used to being stuck indoors. So he probably wasn't a, a, a deterrent, really. Mm, I, and you you reference in the story too that he had a, a massive massive collection of pornography, especially pretty extreme stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, five and a half thousand tapes. Of, it was um, either uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ridiculous. And um, some were well, most were um, proper films, horror films, slash films, um, anime, cartoons, any kind, um, lots of illegal pornography, child pornography, extreme pornography. And then there was some that were um, his homemade tapes, which he sort of took of his uh, victims. So that was kind of a damning piece of evidence when the police got yeah. hold of them. And, uh, and lots of photographs to everything too. So there was no doubt that he was the, the person responsible. Yeah. That's interesting because, I mean, there's some other uh, cases too as well, where they found massive amounts of pornographic material, particularly mm -hmm. the pretty out there stuff and I mean, you can't quite ignore this as being an influence you know no, and, and absolutely. yeah it was the um that, that was kind of the thing that made him do what he did because he never learned to handle those feelings in a healthy way so he just kind of went down a constant disturbed path and got worse and worse as the years went by until he couldn't hold it anymore and he needed to uh sexually assault and rape and whatever so yeah, that's a massive, massive um, influence. Mm, okay, okay. Um, now you've actually, uh, you've you've got a bit of a background in criminal psychology. Uh, you you study this at university? Yes, I did at university a few years ago. Yeah. Mm. So do you think this sort of honed your interest in in uh, uh, true crime writing and serial mm. killers? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I was already writing true crime stuff before I did that degree anyway, strangely. I was sort of writing for a few websites and stuff, but it was after I got my criminal psychology degree that I sort of, um, I was able to do, get, got a few more opportunities and stuff. Um, the way I started was kind of weird. I um, I met, you know, Ian Brady, you probably know him being from England and stuff. What was the name? Ian Brady, the Moors murderer. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got, I got to meet him, strangely. <laughs> and then I sort of wrote about that experience for a magazine. And since then, um, I just wrote for sort of bigger, uh, you know, outlets, bigger um, websites and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, the um, the criminal psychology factor was a, a huge influence in sort of trying to go down this route. Mm. Okay, so, and then the rest is history now. Yeah, it's it's history, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, I'm stuck here now. I can't get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll mention to our listeners too that you are actually in uh, the next book that'll be out this summer, the best new true crime yes. story, Small Towns. So uh, perhaps we're the only one who's in both. No, no, there's there's a there's oh. a there's some other I'm sorry, did you want to so, be the special well, one? <laughs> well, I was the unique one, yeah. yeah no, no. <laughs> no, I do have some I do I do have some people who are in the first in the serial killers who have come back for the small towns book. So so okay. but you're all special. You're all oh. special. Fine, yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. It sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, and I, I mean, I plan to do. I plan to do these interviews again by hook or crook with the weird stuff that keeps going on, trying to get everybody on and technical issues. Mm. But so, so hopefully you could come back and chat about that story when when that happens. Oh, I love that. I could talk forever about that case. That's the. Uh, that's the most unique case. That's another know. really bizarre. I won't, yeah. Oh my I god! Won't say which one it is, yeah. I won't say which one it is, but uh, yeah. No, don't say yeah. But man, I don't know how you don't get nightmares from some of these subjects you write about. Oh, funnily, you should say that because I still do. I mean, <laughs> you know what happens in that case that I wrote about in the new one. Yeah. Sometimes I think about what happened, and I just sort of, you can't explain what happens. Um, it just makes you feel instantly sick. You know, I mean, sometimes you just think, oh, how did he do that? But yeah, we'll talk about that in a few few months time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, I, it looks like I'm going to be doing a third volume in, in this series. And I think we're going mm -hmm. to kind of do a bit of an about, about face and, 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 and lighten the mood a bit just for yeah, some yeah. comic relief. <laughs> yeah, something a bit lighter, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, sounds yeah. good. Yeah.
<laughs> yeah. Um, I, do you have any um, projects in the works you'd like to chat? Tell us about. Um, I actually work for a podcast called The Minds of Madness. I don't know if you know about those. You I think I've heard of it. It's There's so many podcasts. podcasts yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is some. There's too many these days. Yeah, I kind of um, I kind of work for a uh, work for that podcast doing their scripts that they read out every few weeks or so. So that's um, a lot of fun. I'm doing something on a killer called. Uh, Psycho Sam, if you've ever heard of him, he's probably, he's probably not. He's very, very. They they sort of specialise in small cases that no one really knows about. So that's quite a lot of working for them. Um, apart from that, I'm doing a book on. Uh, you might remember this. Do you remember when I pitched to you the story about Daniel Laplante? The he's the guy who hid in the walls of a girl's house. Do you you might not remember. That it. sounds familiar. It was before we were talking about the the story for the next book. And I said to you at this point, it was two. It didn't work out in the end. And I'm doing a full novel about him. He was um, a young kid from sort of um, from Massachusetts who hid in the wall. He stalked this girl and hid in the walls of her house. And oh. that he was the uh, he was her dead mother's ghost. It's kind of a fascinating, fascinating case. That one. I'm doing a book on uh, on him. Uh, and I think that's all I've really got on at the moment. Um, I don't know if you know, but. I'm a counsellor on the side as well as being a writer. So um, that kind of takes up most of my, my days these days. Um, and actually that was what sort of got me onto this uh, story about Satoru Miyazaki, because I don't know if you've ever heard of the Japanese phenomenon of, of hikikomori, where people live inside their houses and never leave. Oh, no, I haven't. Never heard about that. Now, that's kind of what prompted me to sort of study this case a few years ago. Because in my counselling work, um, some guy messaged me and said he wanted to sort of um, better himself because he, uh, he was struggling a little bit. And he was a uh, Japanese guy who lived in uh, Tokyo. And he said, when I talked to him, he said, I haven't left my house in 12 years. Oh, my and God. Said, no, you, so you must have left your house at some point. How do you shop? How do you get anything? He says, no, I've never not left my house in 12 years. I've been in this room for 10 years. And before that, I was just outside and talking to, sometimes talk to my mom and dad and stuff. And that was kind of what got me on the um, on the track for this, because then I started researching this phenomenon. And I found that it's kind of, um, there's about a million people in Japan who are kind of like this, who just live in their house, never leave. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want to go down that path. <laughs> Wait, hey, now this is like normal life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, I suppose they used to. Not yeah, These people were trendsetters. They, they yeah. were ahead of their time. They knew before us, yeah. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> yeah, and that was, that was what got me thinking. So I started oh. researching this. And um, I don't know if you want to go back down the Japanese, Japan Japan route, or what, what do you want to do? Depends with, with where the what? conversation wanted to go. Did you want to go oh. somewhere else, or did you want to go back to Japan? I don't mind. <laughs> No, that's just just so bizarre. But I mean, that's that's just like um, I, you know, there's a lot to be said for not leaving the house. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? I'm, <laughs> I'm having the next time of my life, yeah. I'll yeah, I think I think though, you know, it just depends on how much stuff you could get delivered. You, you know, some places are not as um, uh, out, you know, mm. with it as others, yeah. as well yeah, served. Yeah, yeah, I still yeah. Have some from Amazon for I ordered three weeks ago. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah, it's life now. Get used to it. Yeah. I know, I know. Well, um, it was it was really interesting hearing more about the Rat Man, and we didn't want to give away all these surprises because we want people to read the story and read the book. Um, again, the book, the best new true crime story, serial killers. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> and this is. And Joe Turner, who's been discussing his story, The Rat Man. And uh, Joe, we uh, hopefully I will have you back again and we'll talk about the story that will be in the Small Towns book, um, which will be out in July. So, uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I You're hope welcome, everything goes well. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it's been great. Okay. Speak soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.